So, uh, Yael, uh, we meet uh, for the first time uh, live now, tonight. I saw you briefly over Teams last week. Uh, but just to give a brief introduction, uh, just as uh, Lizzie said, you were born in Israel in 1970, but you now live and work in Berlin and also in Amsterdam, right? And uh, you work mainly with films, installations, photography, staged performances, and public monuments. Um, and a lot of the themes that occur in your work has to do with uh, national identity, trauma, uh, displacement. Um, and uh, in The Undertaker, which is part of this exhibition that we're sitting in right now, um, the relationship between violence and our bodies is also very present. Um, but I would like to begin by asking you something completely different in order to maybe get to know you a little bit, because just as uh, Helena Passion said, most of the people here in the audience have probably only seen The Undertaker, which is part of this exhibition. So I wanted to ask you, uh, what made you uh, want to become an artist? Was it always a dream of yours as a child? How, how come we're mm. sitting here tonight? Oh, <laughs> very, very personal uh, question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation and mm. for making this. I have not seen the work of this exhibition specifically, but mm. I've known Noah's work for many years and I, I love her work and it's really privileged that this is happening here, it's really great. Um, what made me become an artist? It's a good question because it's so much related to... Um, so I never had a dream to become an artist. I actually... <coughs> oh, this is a little bit too, too much. Um, um, no, I was not really uh, dreaming of being an artist. I, somehow I feel it's... A, um, came out very much related to the fact that I actually uh, left um, Israel, that I decided to dedicate uh, my life to being an artist. Um, I was, uh, I think, a photographer from the moment I was born. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, something that uh, I know only because my mom always told me that I had to stop them every every time I saw something beautiful and I had to tell them, look up there and look up there. You know, I was very much into uh, seeing the world and observation and I think Observing is very much also, is so much part of my practice to really look at things and, and, um, and somehow uh, try to understand. And um, <coughs> so for me, um, actually the, uh, trying to understand the place I grew up, which was Israel in my case, was the reason for me to become an artist. And mm. I, um, I understood this is a very, like, making video was a very good tool for me to, again, going back, to, like, using the word observation to observe and look at the things that were familiar to me as a child, as a growing up, uh, growing up in Israel and um, being formed by the state, being so much uh, somehow uh, engineered by the state. Um, um, uh, t the way I read it, of course, as an adult, is a ref reflecting and in a retrospect. But um, um, so I, I actually I, st I studied photography in, in the school in Jerusalem in Bezalel. It's the only academy that actually allowed uh, a degree. Um, and um, saying that, my dream. And now that I think of it, what was my dream to be a, a photographer in National Geographic? So I, I, I traveled for almost a year when I was 20. I traveled almost a year in Africa, taking a lot of pictures mm -hmm. uh, and trying to apply to National Geographic to accept my photographs. Uh, mm -hmm. I was not successful and uh, I, I never made it, but I did make it to a very kind of a small magazine in, in Israel that was had to do with traveling. Uh, so a small picture, my father was very pl proud. Uh, it was published, but um, so making art very much connects for me to my uh, political consciousness and my need to um, to kind of resonate my personal observation towards my country and towards the place I grew up because I became 
once I left Israel in '96, became a very uh, critical and kind of aware. Um, I think one of the best description of, m of me as an artist was A Disappointed Lover by Galit Eilat, who, who kind of looked at my work and, and saw that uh, me as a, I was disappointed because I thought I grew up in one place, but then I realized actually what I grew up it was actually a bubble that kind of burst. Um, so I, I guess my art is very much related to uh, my uh, my own biography in a way. My, uh, so it also evolves in the, in, in the manners and methods and methods and uh, very much coming through um, me as an individual in the world trying to use my the power of art to uh, um, uh, let's say destabilize or kind of trigger uh, the imagination and also kind of uh, counter narrative. So the, the, this was uh, this is the, let's say this is more the intellectual uh, kind of analysis of my work, but it's very very much connected to instinct and very much in the emotional need to to think and rethink and and collectively think. So. Um, I would say that uh, art and being an artist allows us to sit together collectively and experience and look at things and, and share and, um, and triggers uh, something that um, in our mind, in our feelings. That was my long question to your uh, <laughs> very uh, short question, but <laughs> long answer, I mean. But um, mm. honestly, I, I never dreamt to be an artist, but uh, somehow uh, found myself in it. Mm. Lucky <laughs> us uh, in the audience, because I think uh, a lot of people who have seen you work, the mm. undertaker mm. here at Norrköping Art Museum, will testify that they have been really moved by it. And uh, maybe that could then... Um, I will come back to that, but <laughs> actually I wanted to <coughs> ask you one more thing uh, that maybe relates to your drive uh, to want to be an artist, and that has to do with uh, the medium that uh, I know you work mostly through, which is film. And it seems to sit so naturally with you. Uh, and I wonder how you came to realize that this was your medium mm. as an artist. Yeah, I mean, it, I, so we, when I studied the uh, photography, the still photography in the school in Jerusalem, there wasn't very much, uh, the video art wasn't very much a big thing in the school. And uh, But I realized very quickly that the medium of stills, I think, belongs to genius. Like, you have to be really genius to, come to be a very good photographer. And um, actually, photo really good photography um, makes me cry. I think it's one of the mediums that if a really good photographer I'm able to, I mean, and I felt I'm not a genius, I, I, and I, it's not my, it's not a, still photography does not allow me to uh, somehow, um, I don't know, um, I would say express, but actually to, to, to create work that, uh, I, I think I was very much missing the emotional level that uh, I could not bring through a photography. And I thought through a sound that is extremely emotional uh, uh, and movement, I could actually uh, create um, very abstract wor works. I, was, I wasn't I was so critical towards the politics in Israel back then. Uh, I don't think I knew much, not enough. And that was the very utopian moment in 93, you know, the Oslo, uh, that there was, a, and then the break with the assassination of uh, Rabin. I mean, I was at that time, in this kind of utopian moment, uh, and then the dystopia comes, and then, um, but um, it's interesting. One of my first work that actually was also my my uh, let's say the final graduations was uh, I did I, I produced with a, um, a musician um, that her background was uh, uh, contemporary classic music, so very much based on uh, like 20th century. Uh, um, and uh, I also studied in the academy, and I went to study, uh, I, I did a class in music, and I, I really was very much engaged, and I really wanted to see how the image and sound can relate to each other, so that's so that was for me the, the moment already b back in school when I, I kind of, skipped still photography and moved to um, 
experimenting with the um, with video. Uh, it was a um, it w the piece called All Agohim. Uh, only Lizzie can understand what it means. It's a uh, it's light to the Gentiles, and it was the it's like uh, only in the Yiddish culture you can actually understand what it means because that was sort of the. Um, how to explain? It's, it's it's like the 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 sort of the job of the Jew in uh, in in the in the galut in the diaspora uh, to um, to show the light. No, let's say to show the direction. Uh, I, uh, you you can it's translated uh, as light to the nations, which is very strange because it's not really good. goy. You know, goy is gentile. It's not the non-Jews. Anyway, that was my piece, and it was only <laughs> only uh, light work uh, somehow. Um, the problem was that I won a big prize for this piece, and I was I felt like I, I reached I've reached the peak of my career, and I don't have to make art anymore. <laughs> so I <laughs> so I said, okay, then I'm done. I can just uh, do whatever I want, and then uh, I, for four years I did not make any art, and then uh, when I was 30 I, I got accepted to, um, with the same piece, I got accepted to the Rikes Academy. So that was um, mm. going back. So video became, uh, so at that, at that point when I really wanted to, as I said in, in the beginning, understand what is Israel, what is this place that I grew up in, what is it, uh, what construct our national identity or our identity uh, that is very much uh, indoctrinated and it's we you know all the kids by the way there is a very very good new film documentary I recommend to watch even I did not see it but I know it's good uh, it's called innocence it's about kids uh, it's about uh, basically how Israelis are being uh, const uh, being uh, uh, joining the military, it's like uh, the, the, as a kid you already know that you will be, when you're 18, become a soldier and have the weapons in your hands and, have, you know, so it's, a, it's called Innocence and I, I think it's going to be in, probably in CPH Docs in Copenhagen, so mm -hmm. um, it looks very, very interesting. Uh, I already texted with the um, director and <laughs> it, it just uh, premiered in Venice. Um, so we know as kids that we will become soldiers, and uh, and only later, let's say, from the uh, after the second intifada, the, there was a much more uh, an awareness and maybe more res resistance towards this. Uh, um, but for example, that was my first piece. My first piece was I looked, I went back to the place where I was trained as a, in the military, uh, first time holding a gun, first time aiming to a, a sort of the enemy, and. Uh, and I wanted to portray this moment. I wanted to look uh, how um, women uh, holding guns, and there, there's something interesting happens there that um, almost like caring in a manner that is so gentle and, and so so gentle and so care, caring somehow towards the weapon. So it's it's very interesting. Uh, but it's a short film. It's a three minutes in a loop, and um, and this was for me the core became like the really the, the, the let's say the this is what I'm searching this is what I'm interested in finding out and um, oh, and and then okay here here this is the piece I'm putting it to you people and watch it and 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 see what you find in it and and I started to have conversation with them um, in the context of Israel which was very you know the specificity of people already they know they could you know, people say, okay, we smell the weapon when we see you, the, the, the video, you know, so the, there's this uh, memory, mm -hmm. the body, the memory of um, experiencing that moment. So I slowly developed a group of uh, um, body of work that had to do with rituals, with ceremonies, with uh, um, looking how um, it's so it's so well constructed by the state everything that has to do with the with the holocaust memorial and the, the and the soldiers memorial day and the independence day and then the, the jewish holidays everything is planned everything is planned uh, and it is connected to um, um, uh, of course to the past that had to do with the um, the diaspora and then making the new jew 
So the neutral is a, um, uh, a very strong image uh, to actually create a, uh, in, in, in a, a counter to the Jew from the diaspora that is very weak, that had only was busy with the Luftgeschäft and, uh, you know, and uh, busy, busy with the... Um, uh, studying the Torah, like making a, a Jew that is uh, modern, uh, uh, creating a new state, you know, it's super exciting also. That, uh, also, I was interested in the pioneers that came to, to, to the Palestine, not even imagining to build a, a state, but just wanted to oppose the bourgeoisie families back in Europe. So, I mean, you have many, many different layers and you have many, uh, multiple narrative uh, related to the state of Israel. Of course, you have the Mizrahi Jews uh, narrative uh, coming from Arab countries that, uh, and I, I, was, I, I was fascinating how a modern idea of a nation state uh, can, can be so powerful and, and also in a way erase a lot of memory in order to create a new, uh, new uh, um, let's say, new identity. I mean, I mean, look at it, it's from 1948. It's very, very interesting that in no time there is a culture, there is a language that is renewed, and and I was just fascinated that fascinated by this. And um, but of course, it was from a very critical point of view, and and I also uh, titled myself the amateur anthropologist because uh, as anthropology, you look at you know from the outside towards this the clans, you know, the, the tribes, how they function, but it, this tribe, I, I, I was part of it. So you ha I had the inner uh, knowledge like the, of that tribe and, and then the outside view that was more critical. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. So uh, the film that you were talking about with uh, the young women sort of caressing the guns, that's uh, the film that you call Profile, uh, which is right. roughly 20 years old, right? Yeah. And maybe that could be a, a good way to sort of tie in then to The Undertaker, which, uh, which is part of this Noa Eshkoll exhibition, mm. because um, the guns uh, play a really important part in the narrative for this film. Uh, just as you said, you, you've um, created a body of work where uh, staged rituals play a really important mm. part. And for those of you in the audience who may not yet have seen the work, but will see it after the conversation, we can maybe just say that um, uh, there is a, a, a sort of a procession of people uh, going through the city center of Philadelphia in the U.S. Uh, and they are um, led by a very uh, enigmatic uh, person um, ending up in a special place that I will ask you about uh, further on. Um, but I wanted to know a little bit about the background for The Undertaker. And when we spoke last week, you told me that uh, a friend of yours called Diana Schweff, is that the way to pronounce it? Diana Schweff. Diana mm -hmm. Schweff, <laughs> thank you. She's the production manager at the Center for Contemporary Art in Tel Aviv, uh, that she introduced um, the work by Noah Eshkol to you. And I was just really intrigued to learn a little, a little bit about how, how this introduction eventually ended up being the undertaker. How did this project develop? I mean, was it uh, the invitation from the Phil Philadelphia Museum of Art that did it, or what happened? What happened? Um, things happen. <laughs> no, um, so, yeah, Diana Schreff indeed she introduced me to Noeshko's work, um, and it was not until actually Noeshko the work, Sharon Lockhart is an artist from California who worked with, um, uh, I would say, the first artist to work with the uh, uh, archive or the, her legacy. Um, 
so it's not until actually I was in a, a, a performance of the Neuschkoll Ensemble in Vienna that I was like beyond and I, I was speechless when I saw the, because I actually I don't really feel connected to art, uh, to dance, like I don't feel, but, but when I, when I, when I saw them performing, I was speechless. I was like, so, um, first of all, they don't have music and I loved it. They have this also only the metronome and the silent in the, in the, the energy in the space. And um, it was just so beyond words and so beautiful and so powerful. And, and I had the immediate, I was quickly connected to more, more. we had the more and the, and Ruti, we, we were sitting at the dinner and talking and talking and talking endlessly. And I, I was so fascinated. And, and then I went to see the exhibition that was put together for Sharon. And uh, I was very much interested in the, in this archive from the, there's a 1953 piece of work. I think you're show probably showing it here. It's a documentation from, uh, in a kibbutz, it's a kibbutz in the north of Israel, where the um, Noishko was invited uh, to choreograph the, the ceremony, commemoration for the, for the Holocaust. And when I saw the work, I was like blown away because I, I could not believe this, is hap this happened in 53. And what was interesting for me is this uh, extremely abstract movement that very much looked like uh, the young, uh, Nazi uh, propaganda cinema that I, I was so obsessed with that anyway. Uh, at that time, um, the, the, the kind of the collective and the movement and the sync and the, 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 and, and the uniforms and the, like the Hitler Jugend really resonated when I saw it. it was so confusing that how it happened in Israel, uh, such a um, choreography. And then um, I, I had a long conversation with Moore and I, I, I told her that we really have to, I have to do something with this because it's so interesting for me to, to look at it. Um, and I'd, I already then I lived in Berlin and I was already so much involved, thinking so much about uh, the history and um, and I felt something should happen. And we started to develop uh, ideas, uh, di many different ideas. Um, and then I, I interviewed, also I, I encouraged uh, more to start to interview, uh, interview uh, people were, that were quite old already and involved in, in the in the uh, uh, worked with her, knew her so well. So we started collecting also interviews and uh, then I said, you have, we have to make a movie and then all that, but it didn't happen. But anyway, she continued uh, uh, making interviews, and in the interviews, I'm learning all this information about the history of Noish Kohl um, and her connection to Laban and Wigman and and all this uh, uh, legacy from Germany. You know, like uh, the um, Laban movement, and uh, then things started to make sense to me. Um, <coughs> and uh, and again, so this this uh, the war migration and bringing your culture to a new place and, and creating um, something new. Mm -hmm. So there is a now a commemoration to the Holocaust. So I thought this is very interesting to, to migrate a form, to migrate uh, uh, an idea related to, to violent and to violence and to history. Uh, um, and what happens if I put if we take this to another context of uh, violence, and in, in the context of Philadelphia, I wanted to look into the um, um, the constitution, so because the, the in Philadelphia the independence, the, the declaration of independence happened, and the the constitution, the Second Amendment, the, and so. This is what happened, and uh, when I was so I was invited to Philadelphia by the museum, Philadelphia uh, Museum, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, to produce a new public art project, and then so one thing led to another, and uh, and I proposed to to bury weapon, mm. and the burial of the weapon has to do also with the at that same time I worked on Two Minutes to Midnight, which was shown at the gallery, and that in uh, and partly in this in this film um uh it's an old all women uh, government that um uh, studying a policy of disarmament and uh, one of the thing is to bury weapons so 
you put the one and one together, you, see, you understand the point. But that was the working in Philadelphia. I, it was an opportunity for me to um, put in action an idea of burial of weapons. Uh, so there is the context of Philadelphia, and there is the context of my work, and there is a. Um, they need to also the of of course there was a question why and why an Israeli artist actually is proposing to bury weapons in the United States what she has to do with that I don't really but I think it's a, it's an uh, obvious idea that we should uh, bury weapons mm. and part of the um, action in the public space it wasn't only to bury the weapons um uh, we invited uh, speakers from the city activists politicians um, and to 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 give a speech, they gave a speech in the muni uh, city, the city next to the, um, the municipality, yeah, mm. where the declaration of independence took place. So um, the idea of uh, civil action and art and uh, imagination um, comes together in one performance, um, yeah. Yeah. And a lot of police. A lot of police mm -hmm. also. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of curious because, you know, when you you see the film, it's interesting because it doesn't actually have uh, a spoken um, uh, sound. Uh, of course, it has a sound, the atmosphere and, and the sound that you put on it, but it's nobody speaking uh, words in the film. Yet it's so charged uh, with emotions and that made me really interested in how you directed the dancers and, and the actors like you know how did you build up to this really charged atmosphere that's in the film uh, is it possible to to say something about the background work <laughs> Um, so for this piece, I invited Mo Bashan to choreograph uh, based on the Noesh Kohl's movement. I mean, it's actually before she wrote the movement notation. It's actually, it's uh, it's based on the movement that appeared in the ceremony in 1953. So they, they studied the movements and we wanted to, uh, we wanted to um, basically quote the elements and create a, 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 a social mo monument, like a public monument or a movement. Mm, I, I, told her I would like to make a moving, moving monument. Um, so uh, Moore came, came with me several times to Philadelphia, and we uh, we auditioned uh, uh, we auditioned um, dancers uh, for one week. We invited the uh, dancers from Philadelphia to audition and to see we, we, we had to choose who can actually learn the movement so quickly. Um, <coughs> and then, um, so one thing was to prepare, which was, it was extremely challenging, you can imagine. Uh, one thing is to prepare for live performance. And we also knew that we cannot uh, uh, take everybody, all the audience, to the to the cemetery where we buried weapons. So we had to find an alternative. And so one thing is to to really work on a, on a, a new dance, basically. And 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 the um, protest in the street. So we had to block the center of Philadelphia. And imagine in the context of U.S., I mean, how crazy it is to walk with weapons. I mean, who, who can guarantee that uh, somebody will not join and, and start shooting? I mean, it can be, it's, it is scary and it's extremely difficult to get permission to walk with, uh, and we had a lot of police and we had, they had, had to, I mean, we worked with props from the cinema, no? like uh, TV, uh, movie props, it's not real, I mean, nothing can, can happen, but they had a policeman checking every single uh, gun. Um, it was important for me to have, uh, to look at the history of guns in, in, in the US and uh, the different guns from different periods, so all of that we included in the, in the performance. Um, and then to also, uh, to teach, you know, the, we had to work on the walking, which is not part of the, not so much part of uh, Noish called in, in, in the uh, 53, but uh, 
they had to walk in certain way through the city um, and create this tension and kind of focus. And um, so we rehearsed. We rehearsed and rehearsed. Uh, we had four days to rehearse, and we and then they uh, they made it. And um, it was stressful. I tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <coughs> and also, I had a whole team of uh, of. Uh, a big team to to document everything and um and uh, we we could foresee many things but i could not foresee for example the very uh, beautiful police person who was extremely charismatic in uh, during the during the action itself and then she was just uh, we had already we talk, i talked to her before I, I prepared her that we would like her to be part of the <laughs> of the of the film and um and she became yeah she became uh, and, and this is these are these ex sort of accidents that you cannot foresee and it's more like documenting yeah. mm. so uh because both in uh, the undertaker and in two minutes to midnight uh, you have used this um construction of both working with the uh, performance and also uh, shooting film that yeah. eventually turns out to be the film installation. Uh, and the performance for The Undertaker was called Bury Our Weapons, Not Our Bodies. Mm -hmm. why, why do you construct your uh, art project like this uh, in the, the duality of the performance and the film? Is it to seek these kind of accidents or how did you come up with this particular way of working? It's a financial reason. Financial. <laughs> <laughs> you have to explain. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> I have a very good uh, producer mind, to be honest. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I, I will go. So the, the two minutes to midnight is based on performances, because I was invited to the theater to make uh, live performance. I was invited to the um, film fe um, theater festival, but in my heart, I'm a filmmaker. So I agreed with them that yes, we can do live performance, but actually I really want to make a film. Um, and so um, they, we agreed that uh, part of the performance is actually shooting the, the, the live performance. Um, and I knew that I would like to, uh, that part of the film of Two Minutes to Midnight will be bearing the weapons. And now I have a notation from Philadelphia to bear it, to, uh, which is all about bearing weapons. And I have to document it to be able to use it for my Two Minutes to Midnight film, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm joking that it's financial, but it it is also. But, mm. but um, th so the live performance is important because it has one, uh, it has a it's a different experience. Uh, audience, when they are experiencing, uh, first of all, it's only people in Philadelphia who can actually watch, uh, be part of it, and, and observe it, and and take something out of it. And uh, um, but the people out there, like in here, for example, would not be able to see it. And I wanted mm -hmm. to make a film based on that, mm -hmm. separately from the two minutes to midnight. To it is uh, almost like an activist work. This, this is an opportunity to, to, um, you know, to to say that we should bury weapons. Um, I must say that in Israel it would be it would be uh, seem very kind of uh, cynical. I don't think in Israel I would never be able to do an action of burying weapons. Mm -hmm. I think uh, mm, there not? is a kind of cynicism. But maybe Lizzie, you can uh, you can uh, say what you think. But I I wanted to do it, and I I mm. wanted to uh, because of course in the context of Israel it makes sense. But uh, on the other hand, it's like um, it's part of the landscape. It's part of the everyday life to see people wearing a, a gun. It's not um, people are so used to it. It's not something that is so special. And and uh, but all of a sudden seeing it feel in Philadelphia in in a city that is extremely violent. I mean. I, it's not a joke. I mean, there there's so many incidents and still going on incident in schools and in public spaces mm. and people are so extremely obsessed with guns. Mm. I, I during the research I, I came across 
people that like they have storage of weapons just and they went to gun shops, I talked to people, I mean, there is extreme obsession with <laughs> guns uh, from a different reason. For mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting, the right to bear arms comes from the democratic, uh, from the lefty sort of the, uh, when they say to, uh, to bear arms is to protect yourself, right? But of course it was, it is used differently. Mm. Um, so, in the Undertaker, I mean, the, 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 well, part of the film is, as you've said, this burial of weapons, and that um, sort of ties into another thing I wanted to ask you that I find really fascinating, and that is that you've coined a term uh, that you call pre-enactment, yeah. which is opposite then to re-enactment. And re-enactment, of course, is whenever you um, reproduce an event that has taken place. Um, and I'm sure in Philadelphia this probably happens too, um, in some of these places that occur in your film. And I was just really curious how you developed this term pre-enactment and if you could explain to the audience what, what you mean by it. Um, I think pre-enactment pre pre is a, a lot has to do with the, the potentiality of, uh, of uh, future or, or I would say even alternative um, present. Um, so yeah, in, in first of all, Philadelphia is the city of reenactments. I met uh, several uh, reenactors. That's their job. The, the, the job is actually to join uh, reenactments. They live from that. There are performers who, or some of them, it's their hobby to um, to join events of reenactment and uh, s related to the Civil War, for example. And uh, when I was in Philadelphia, I visited several uh, reenactments events. One one of them was in a cemetery. And um, it is quite interesting to this kind of uh, need to to play uh, p different periods and. Um, um, so uh, pre-enactment began actually in, in 2013 with my work from uh, um, uh, Inferno from Brazil. Mm -hmm. So where um, and it has to do a, a little bit. Mm, it is connected to historical event. Always pre-enactment. The way I see it, it is connected to to historical event and how they are uh, affecting um, present days. And uh, through these uh, historical events and the present, you can actually foresee in the future. Mm -hmm. So uh, vid videos are actually that I, the Inferno is about, um, it, it is a crazy video. It's about um, the Temple of Solomon that was built in uh, Sao Paulo in 2014. It was actually, they, f they completed the, the, the construction of the, the temple um, after, the, after we shot the film. Um, it is a, it, it's in Sao Paulo and it, connect, uh, it is from the evangelist uh, church that became extremely powerful in, in Brazil uh, in recent years, uh, much stronger than the Catholic church and um, one of the leaders of the church uh, decided to build a, a, um, um, a five, five fields, five, the size of five fi uh, football fields church. And it is mm -hmm. based wow. on studies that it's, it's based on Solomon Temple, so the first okay. temple. Okay. So he actually uh, erased the whole neighborhood, bought out people from the neighborhood and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and flatten it and, and create, build this massive building. You can Google it and see how crazy it is. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> And I was, when I heard about the story, I was like, my God, of course this uh, temple, ne we, we have to destroy it because in the history of Judaism, temples are being destroyed. So in the film is actually, it tells the story of uh, the construction of a new temple uh, and then the destruction of it. And in that sense, this is the, uh, so, some sort of pre-enactment. It's kind of uh, already foreseeing the future of that building um, based on historical events. Okay. So that, that this is one thing to look at pre-enactment, but yeah. it, what it does, it it um, 
it creates an alternative reality because the mm. building is still there. So mm. the video is the alternative. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and the, v the very end of the, um, the film is actually after it's being destroyed, there is a new wall and it's uh, kind of the new wedding wall. Mm -hmm. So it creates a new Jerusalem and then mm -hmm. it makes you think what is Jerusalem outside if of its territory. Yeah. So what is Jerusalem in Sao Paulo? Mm. And, um, and that relates also, I mean, I will say one more thing. It relates to the vision of this uh, bishop because he wanted to, he said, members of my church cannot, most of them cannot go to Jerusalem because financially they cannot allow it. So I will bring Jerusalem to them, to, 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 to Sao Paulo. Yeah. And he actually flies, uh, he, he, he brought uh, stones from Jerusalem. Wow. <laughs> so it's it is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah I mean, talking about uh, reenactments, um, there are some soldiers uh, in your film, The Undertaker, um, and they wear these uh, uh, costumes that I assume are related then to the American Civil War mm. or. Uh, are they also this? Uh, how did you find these guys? Are they these people who uh, take it as a hobby or my assistants? Oh, your assistants. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. My assistant, my 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 nephew is. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he, I see. He, he flew. He flew all the way from uh, California. He studied um, in California. To be, he wanted to be a director and a filmmaker, and he came to help us in the production. Yeah. So he said, he looks like Tom Cruise, actually. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very <laughs> handsome. <laughs> but it's interesting because uh, there is this, um, there is uh, sort of um, uh, interesting in The Undertaker, there, there, are, there is a, a shift, you could say, of, um, atmosphere taking place in the film. Uh, in some instances, I feel very present in Philadelphia, especially when the procession is walking through the city center, but then when everybody ends up in uh, Laurel Hill Cemetery, I think it is, there the tonality shifts and it, it becomes almost otherworldly and a little bit ghost-like and I guess the, um, the soldiers help create this atmosphere, atmosphere. And you've talked a little bit uh, about um, your interest in sort of history and the present, but uh, I mean, in what way do you think history helps you think about the future? It's a really hard question, <laughs> I guess. It's a big question. Yeah. Um, um, I think I'm, I'm trying to... Uh, um <coughs> I always been trying to understand if uh, the history that is this the history that I read from books or I watch in movies and um, how much this is how much power it has on uh, on uh, us on our imagination of I mean we we did not experience that um, mm. um, but I think I think it's it's like it's clearly it's part of the cu cultural package that we all have and and so. Uh, as much as we want to deny it, it's like it's part of us. It's part of our, um, like we all growing in different cultures and we have different experiences and different histories. Um, but every time um, I, I was very one of the things that for me was it's fascinating that I never thought I'm Jewish. Yeah. For example, I never. Yeah. I mean, for me, I was. I never understood why people, like why I'm invited to Jewish stuff at some point. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, um, I really, I seriously, I, it's it's a very in interesting, being an Israeli, you don't think you're Jewish. Mm -hmm. Because we, we don't, we, I grew up in a very secular, very kind of labor movement uh, family and it was all about uh, very much, uh, it's not about the spirit, it's not all, that we, l we lost that on the way because of, we, n we know why, uh, many different reasons. Um, um, 
And it, it goes back even to before the state of Israel, also the in Euro European Jewry. I, I look at it because I live in Europe, but in, uh, also deny the, um, uh, the uh, mystical Judaism, you know, like the, the very unknown uh, study of and, and the, the journeys that, that that was also denied at some point because of modernism, because of uh, modernity, and and so I don't know. Uh, it goes in circles, I guess. Mm. Uh, the needs and um, just to re and, and anyway. So when you are Israelis living in Europe, you become this Jew because mm. that's what they look at you because you look like a Jew, I guess. <laughs> and I'm trying to be looking like a. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to. Uh, fit my family who is very blonde. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, this it's part, I mm. guess. I don't know if I answer a question, but maybe next time I'll think about a good answer. Um. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome back. <laughs> yeah, um, I think we're, we're <laughs> about to round off uh, the conversation and maybe let... But it gets more funny later if you continue. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe then uh, I will uh, give you uh, another really no, difficult okay. question, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I know that you're very interested in sort of trying to find out what art can do, and that is also the headline for this evening's conversation. What can art do? It's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it can do a lot of things. Uh, art. Yeah. Um, mm. I would love to have one of those at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> yeah. I, I, I guess I'd, I. This is a question that I ask because I'm in a constant battle with art and being an artist and mm. why I'm an artist and why this all this. Mm -hmm. um, but then comes the. Um, I think it, um, I mean, art is many different things, as we know. And what I choose is to, um, more and more it, it became uh, not only observing, but actually using uh, art as a way to uh, imagine something differently, to create new, uh, uh, to cre I guess to create my own world, the, the world that I would like to live in, mm -hmm. that is a kind of, um, undermining a kind of narrative that I often, uh, I, I think one of my most important work that I feel that also I kind of own my entire, uh, I, I really gave everything that I could, uh, was the Polish trilogy from 2000, uh, that was done between 2007 and 2011, when I was also feeling that I can really change the world. I think mm -hmm. I gave up, gave up on that, yeah. but um, that I felt that art can really, shake everything and has the power to to um, to really disable uh, from the from very deep mm. place and the, the really um, and I think uh, I was very happy to see that I succeeded because I confused everybody yeah and uh, the conf and I, I really like when the audience is confused and not satisfied and uh, really um, the ambivalency and the ambiguity and dialectics of the image and the not knowing what the hell is going on. Mm. Does she really is she really meaning to send the Jews back to Poland to the to the worst place on pla on earth for the Jews? Yeah. Or is it uh, ironic? Mm. And this confusion mm. uh, makes people, I think, work and makes them think and mm. try to find answers. And uh, and I've been in in uh, in endless conversation around the work mm. uh, with um, a lot of right-wing people from mm -hmm. the Israelis who um, basically said, how you dare to send us to the gas chambers? Mm. Because this is where history left us. Mm. But um, it's also propagated by the state of Israel. I mean, and at the same time I would say, yes, this is the very anti-Semitic place. The identity of Polish people, I don't know if there are Poles here, but Poles is being Catholic, being so, it is part of that. Um, and, and, and it's fascinating how an, an anti-Semitism can exist when you don't have Jews around. <laughs> so it was very fascinating. Mm -hmm. 
so yes it's a um, it was controversial and and it was a collaboration with the Pol polish person who wanted to change poland who had his own he grew up in during communist time that actually not really growing up when jewish community was there uh, even in 68 was in the moment where Jews were, uh, yeah, 20,000 Jews were, uh, they call it the windows of, window of opportunities or were expelled. And mm. many of them arrived to Sweden. I mm. don't know if anyone here is part of this. Mm. Um, so, um, what did I want to say? I don't know. Um, th yeah, so art should... Um, do all this and yeah. uh, um, has the power. I really, I mean, there are many great artists who manage to do it. And mm. uh, in recent years, more political uh, art is, you know, is very much uh, central to uh, many, many exhibitions. And um <coughs> uh, it has also done, for for my for my taste, sometimes uh, problematic. Um, because sometimes it's um, and what uh, what I choose not to do is not to have a very clear agenda, mm. as um, because I sort of my agenda is to uh, uh, trigger the imagination or be become a catalyst for for change or even the catalyst and even on a psychological uh, psychoanalysis uh, level to uh, the, the images can be. Um, a catalyst for change mm. Mm. and so and maybe analyst <laughs> they can analyst can I think that some of the images I produce in my last work for Germany um mm. <laughs> yeah and I mean uh, art is amazing in the way that you know this Israeli artist Noah Eshkol who was born in 1924 in the British Mandate for Palestine. She's now exhibited in a municipal art museum in Sweden and brought you all the way here also from Germany with your amazing piece, The Undertaker. So yeah, that's another answer uh, to what art can do. Uh, but I really would love to uh, invite the audience. I'm sure that uh, some of the things that uh, have come up during the conversation tonight uh, has uh, created some questions or some confusion. Confusion, hopefully, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I'm sure, uh, yeah, I think we have a microphone, or if we don't, then we can. Uh, I know one person has a very provocative question. <laughs> <laughs> you promised. So? <laughs> <laughs> you set it all up. <laughs> it's part of the fiction and the... the yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk, both of you. Um, I was fascinated to hear uh, how you described um, your first um, impressions of encountering dance um, and that you didn't have any specific relationship uh, to dance but then that something happened and you didn't exactly uh, said what, and maybe you don't know what, but it would be lovely to hear more about what dance does to your process <coughs> and also what dance does to your work. If you would please elaborate a little bit on that. It would be really fascinating to hear. Um, Thanks. I think uh, there was a kind of, uh, what I experienced there, and I guess it to s people, ha people experience it with art in different ways. Uh, there was a s uh, some kind of uh, magic that I experienced, uh, and I think what um, I think what la one of the things that uh, also I, s I see that is it's part of the you know the uh, re trying to reach the fourth dimension with a sphere, right? The, there is a kind of uh, the. Um, 
kind of spiritual. I, I'm very not spiritual in, in my, I, I don't do anything that is, uh, I don't do a, all this, uh, how do you say, um, meditation. I go nuts from that, so I don't, I <laughs> but, <laughs> but there is, I, I'm, it's, I'm still fascinated by it, by the uh, possibility and, um, and uh, there was something in th that happened between the dancers and in the space that uh, I'd never experienced. And um, also, again, I, I would say again, that I think the fact that there was just the rhythm that's so much connected to the heartbeat and some so much connected to um, that I, I really recall it as a, as a um, elevating experience. And uh, th there was not so much... Um, It wasn't decorative, it felt so uh, pure and very kind of um, authentic. The movement, uh, the uh, almost scientific. Um, I don't know, so, so th this is what happened and, and, um, and because I, I guess because I'm so much into movement, I, I am like, uh, I don't know if you know my early works with the trucks, you know that? Anyway, it's a funny work about uh, um, Israeli uh, Israelis in their cars uh, driving uh, in the landscape outside of Tel Aviv, uh, trying to conquer the hill. It's called Kings of the Hill. Mm -hmm. So they're just driving back and forth, and uh, and uh, there's a lot of movement. It's almost it looks like a dance in the film. Uh, so dance is many different things for me in that sense that of that how what ha what hap whatever I can capture in this frame that I put you know with my, my camera and and let things happen. So, um <coughs> so uh, it so to that what happened to me with Noah Call work that was really and um, and there was uh, something that. You know, Ashko's work for that for me, and I think she would disagree with me if she heard this talk. Uh, that she would say she wasn't political, but to me, she was externally political, um, and she represent um, a moment in the Israeli society that had to do a lot with uh, um, melancholy and uh, and and loss and and. Um, mourning. Because a, a lot of people were killed in wars at the, at the time she so, and then the, it goes back to the body that is this kind of uh, um, fragility of the body. I don't, you know, there is something and and it's it, and it's so pure. It's just the body moves and is not supported by any any kind of, uh, and I think that was really fascinating for me. Um, and in, in the 1953 work, it's like they really, you, you can see that there is this um, between being a victim and then heroes at the same time. The, the, the way how the body is moved in the space and as a collective, like going into, as a herd, you know, to the, to the end, towards the end. And um, I don't know if it makes sense what I said, but... Um, so it makes me think about your comments also about your work being, um, what did you say, uh, your agenda is being a catalyst. And I think to kind of, to, I think when dance encounters your way of working with video, I think that is a very powerful encounter for catalyzing something. So. I don't know. That's that's how I think about it. Anyway. But thank you so much for your answer. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a dancer? Sorry. Are you a dancer? Uh, no, not uh, no. physically, but you know. <laughs> you love. <laughs> you, you love dance. I definitely dance. Yeah. <laughs> Can I just uh, add uh, that uh, the Nora Eshkol Chamber Dance Group will actually come here to the museum. Um, on the 22nd and the 23rd of the sep September, they will hold uh, workshops uh, for those of you who would like to experience and maybe explore this sort of 
di di dichotomy uh, between you know strength and vulnerability. That vulnerability. Yeah, yeah that's that the word I was searching. Yeah. Yeah. Um, s and then on uh, Saturday, the 24th of September, they will uh, hold a uh, performance in uh, the Great Exhibition Hall uh, across the hallway. So I I'm really excited about this myself because you were talking about living monuments before, <laughs> and I, I, I always, I, I, I don't know what to expect, but uh, I sort of expect almost meeting Noah in a way. <laughs> yeah, so a tip to you if you would like to maybe challenge yourselves. I know it's, uh, you're a dancer in your head, uh, but I know a lot of people find it challenging to maybe explore their bodies in this way, but I'm sure it will be an amazing no, experience. It's absolutely sad that Ruti cannot yeah. yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I was very lucky to to get to know Wuti um, until the very, very end of her life. She passed, um, mm. and she, she and Moore actually performed in one in an exhibition when I first saw the Undertaker, uh, the Undertaker in Berlin. They came to perform in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, yeah, she was very because she really from the seventies uh, performed with uh, an and practice rehearsed and study in Irish called uh, mm. uh, movement. <laughs> there was another question. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Yael, for this uh, fruitful uh, uh, conversation. Uh, it's very interesting, this preference you have to images and to words, and Helena mentioned that there are no words, anything. Uh, probably you believe that uh, it's through images you can communicate messages uh, better to the to the audience. They are more powerful. Uh, but I'm thinking, since we live in the era of uh, images, could you reconsider of using some words or anything <laughs> <laughs> like reestablish their status in the, um, or, or, it, it, this relationship is is always very very. Uh, I, I do use words, but they always come in rhetoric and the manifest in ma manifest in speeches. And uh, the p whole Polish trilogy was a very uh, wordy, very much about text, very much about um, communicating through uh, through words. Um, I, I mean, I never made any film that has dialogue, like in a kind of conventional way of making films, but uh, yes, I am an image maker. As I said, I, um, I'm, I, always, I always start with an image. Everything I do st begins with, a, with an image, and, um, and then I start to develop the narrative. And um, like in my last work also, uh, uh, it's a 40 minutes, uh, three channel installation for the Jewish Museum in Berlin. Malka Germania is all about images, there are no words, and it, it's just, when I started, when I tried to work with the words for this film, it made no sense, it just, the images were overpowering anything that you can, so I, I look talkative, but I'm actually not, I mean, the sound may be like, I know, but <laughs> <laughs> I think images is, yeah, they can, they can do a very good uh, job. The staged actor. <laughs> He's always coming to my talks, <laughs> so I can uh, have exactly. a question. <coughs> Either a stalker or actor. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think in, in relation now, because you mentioned uh, your latest work now, Malka Kamania, which was part of the Redemption Now exhibition in, uh, in Berlin, and I just think it would be interesting if you could talk about uh, a bit about uh, the notion of redemption in your works. Mm. Because I also see it here in, in The Undertaker, this kind of ritual, which you have in many of your works, where you kind of provide, okay, an end, ending of the old history, and then the start of the new history that you have created through the pre-enactment method and everything. So, is this what you see? Is this uh, you making redemption or is it something else? 
I think that's the, the thing that is very Jewish in me. Really, if I think what is, what is, what, what is it that is Jewish in me, <laughs> besides my genetics, uh, but culturally, the, 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 need for, um, the need for redemption, the need for change, the need to undermine, to, to, to flip things upside down, to decide uh, that um, uh, um, and, and that is very much connected to an action and that's very much connected to political imagination because the act of imagining, the act of um, is something that you almost have to rehearse to it. You have to train yourself to imagine. So for me, redemption is a, is a kind of um, activate me to think in a, in a, it's, it's, it's like almost like it became a method like the, to use redemption as a way to uh, mm, propose a change because when you look at the stories from the Bashevi Zinger or you look like uh, at stories of the, the if you look at the the false messiah Shabbat Tzvi from the 17th century that um, he flipped things upside down. Everything. I mean, it was it's the stories that you read about him the, um, are um, sound crazy, but to me they sound so normal and so needed in a society that. Um, mm. Anyway, I don't know. I think it's just a very crucial need for me to. Uh, and the uh, redemption has to happen now. So the title of the exhibition at the Jewish Museum called Redemption Now, which is kind of uh, oxymoron. I mean, redemption is something that you actually look up for in the moment of redemption. And uh, it's something that has a kind of... Um, and, then, and then also, yeah, one thing that I'm thinking is this a linear... Is this linear? Like a redemption, is it something that we that has a is a really in the future or or is something that is actually nonlinear? I don't know. Yeah, that's a redemption. But I think Noah's Noah's is a very redemptive as well. I think she has a also redemptive moment at least redemptive moments. As a se very secular Jew, she was. Yeah. And Israel meant to be the redemption also. <laughs> Redeeming the uh, the Jews, you know. Uh, thank you for the conversation. Uh, I got a bit curious about the masks in the film, the black and white masks. Uh, what can you tell about them? Um, yeah, so the, a part of the procession with the guns, I wanted to have also a, a visual statement, and um, that is not uh, without words. <laughs> the only the only text we had is, was the title of the work with. Uh, weapons, not our bodies, and I wanted to have, I didn't want to have a protest where people carry uh, signs and with different uh, statements that are, will be sort of obvious. Mm. And then so we, st with graphic designer I worked with for many years, we I wanted to abstract uh, the mask. It started with the gas mask. Gas mask is really like, uh, you know, um, very much related to to war, and I we started, and then I said, but let's try to create different kind of faces that will be oversized, and people will we look for volunteers. All of people working there are volunteers who join the the work, um, and it becomes this kind of uh, also very much connects to the culture of uh, anonymous and the kind of uh, sabotage and. Uh, uh the, you know what I mean, the mask in the... Um, uh, how do you call it? Um, anonymous? Yeah, the... the, the yeah. Mm -hmm. So, that was the, the reason. And then... Um, yeah. 
But can I ask, because I also was curious about the mosques and um, my association was actually more to sort of Greek theater and the use of, of masks in that context. And that's also kind of a fascinating thought that, you know, you can stretch time in this way all the way from anonymous to, to Greek theater if that was ever an association <laughs> that well, you yourself well, made? Yeah, well, mask is historically used in so many contexts of mm -hmm. rituals. And um, mm -hmm. I was uh, trying to be very careful not to kind of appropriate uh, African masks. Uh, I was really trying to find my way to make the, the mask so that's because it's extremely sensitive. Um, the polit you know, identity politics and um, who is entitled to do what? And um, I don't. W I'm very careful about it. Um, I'm. I'm also never representing the, the Palestinians. This is something that um, I always speak for my. You know, my, it's my voice that has to do it. I don't. They have their own voice. You know, Palestinians. So in, when I worked for seven years and very much connected to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I. I was very careful. So. This is something quite important for me. Thank you, Yael, for, Thank you. for Thank coming. You for it was audience. amazing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>